Hey, what up everybody? This is Stevie Breach coming to you. I want to know what everybody is watching on the WCW Network. It's like that because it seems like on the WWE Network, the one thing that I've been watching more than anything is the past WCW. I got a little bit scared off from doing the NWO reviews because of how you know, awkward and how bad I thought that Hog Wild was. So I thought, hey, I'll switch this up and I'll watch something a little bit different. I watched two shows on my lunch two days in a row uh, from to the 2000 uh, year of WCW, the, the, the last full year that they were in effect. These shows were really good to me because it just was like, I remember when, you know, Eric Bischoff and Vince Rosso tried to co-live together. This was years before they tried to do it in TNA. This is back in WCW. It didn't work this time. I don't know why they thought it would work again, but basically both of these guys thought they were uh, as a genius. You know, you know, Eric Bischoff is the guy that built, um, you know, the, the WCW and got it to the point that it was at, was at its highest. You know, Vince Russo takes all the credit for getting WWE to hit peak and uh, they both weren't able to run WCW and keep it at its, its highest potential. So maybe if they thought if two minds came together, they would be able to balance each other out and they'd be able to try and push WCW up. And basically, the one thing that they thought of was, you know, everybody knows why, you know, WCW isn't working, is they're not creating new stars, is because they pay all these old guys so much that they can't push the younger talent because they can't, you know, they can't, sort of like have a meaning for why they're giving so much money to this other guy over here. So basically they split up the locker room. Old guys over here, young guys over here. We had the Millionaires Club against the New Blood. And this was a pretty good, uh, you know, uh, sort of thought. The only thing was is that once they came up with the idea, basically with everybody trying to throw in their two cents and basically the, uh, the inmates running the asylum, even though everybody knew this was a latch ditch effort to save the company, Nobody wanted to go along with the flow, and uh, everybody wanted to uh, basically, uh, you know, switch sides, be a babyface, be a heel, do what they want to do, and, and nothing really got, you know, um, solved in the long run. So, this show I'm going to be doing a review on is The Great American Bash 2000. Um, honestly, pretty good show. Some good stuff on here. A lot of stuff is sort of like, it wasn't spectacular, uh, so, you know, make sure you go uh, check this out. You know, maybe it's one of the things that'll catch your uh, your eyes. It is probably one of the peaks of the uh, of the 2000 era of WCW. Uh, lots of good, uh, you know, as WCW, much like TNA, uh, they got to throw in those stipulation matches to make you think that you're uh, going to be uh, really, really peaked to go at it. First match was a WCW Cruiserweight Championship match. Lieutenant Loco with the Misfits in action going up against Disco Inferno and uh, the uh, Filthy Animals. Both guys had their whole corners packed. There was people all around the ring. Um, it was basically uh, Chavo Guerrero in there wrestling around with Disco. Nothing really like a barn burner like a lot of WCW pay-per-views are where they, you know, they tear the house down in the opening match and be like, yeah, we're watching the pay-per-view. We love us some wrestling. Um, there was a, a spot in the match uh, where just basically the ref went down, and to, to counteract the ref going down, everybody that was outside of the ring jumped in the ring and hit their you know signature finishing move on the other guy on the other opposing team. Uh, the last guy to jump into the ring was a Corporal Cajun who went by Lash LaRue, a guy that I thought was going to have a real bright future in the WWE, or in the WCW. And he was one of the guys that got picked up with the WWE when they had the uh, WCW merger or the WCW they acquired him, whatever it was. He was one of the guys that got picked up, never got out of developmental. But I always liked the guy. Uh, he he uh, basically didn't do what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to jump in the ring, hit his finisher, grab Chavo and put him on, on top of Disco. Basically, he hit his finisher and he jumped outside of the ring. The ref came too because he knew it was the point that he was supposed to turn around and start his three count and then Chavo would win. The only problem was nobody picked up Chavo and put him on top of Disco. So he just laid there. The ref looked like he didn't know what to do. So just <laughs> Lash LaRue just jumped back in the ring, walked over, picked over a Ch picked up Chavo, laid him across Disco, and got out of the ring. While the whole time doing this, none of the filthy animals did anything. They just watched on the outside as the ref counted the one, two, three, and they got the win. Uh, after the match, uh, there was a little bit of a scuffle between the filthy animals and uh, basically. Um, uh, Hugh Morris's general erection. His grandpa came down. It was Gramps. He was in a full army attire, and uh, he was trying to get all up on Tigress. 
and basically the filthy animals laid him out. The only thing that really, you know, got in my mind that was a little bit weird was everybody was calling Tigress their girl. Conan, Rey Mysterio, Hoover 2 Guerrero. Was everybody wearing this chick out? I have no idea who she was connected to. In my mind, when I look back, I thought she was with Rey Mysterio, but Conan was really protective of her saying, like, yo, that's my girl. Why are you trying to disrespect her like that? So I don't know if maybe everybody was taking Tigress in the locker room, having a shot with her. But, um, you know, basically in the, in the, when Gramps got laid out, Gramps was laying out, and uh, basically everybody thought that he was dead. Major Guns tore his shirt off, finally jumped down, Gave the guy mouth to mouth, and he came to life, as most of us would do. Um, you know, from here, we go to Chronic uh, versus the Marmalukes. Uh, this was for the uh, WCW World Tag Team Championships. Um, really nothing special here. I really liked Chronic as a team. It just This wasn't the match that really highlighted and showcased who they were. Uh, Mike Awesome versus DDP in an ambulance match. That's skippable. GI Bro going up against Sean Stasiak in a boot camp match. That was uh, basically a last man standing match where uh, you know Booker T got the win. Uh, Shane Douglas and the Wall were supposed to have what was a normal tables match, and Shane Douglas went out there and gave what was an ECW like really good promo, challenging the Wall to make this match better. He changed it to a best of five table match, where basically there was one table on each outside corner of the ring and one table that was in the ring and the first person to put their tape their their guy through three tables making it a best of five would win the match they fought around the wall put shane douglas through two tables pretty easy pretty fast which we think you'd wear the guy out and you'd be able to put the guy through another table for no big deal shane douglas stacked three tables on top of each other was able to knock the wall through all three so they counted that it is three table shots and uh, Shane Douglas got the win over the wall. The wall was a guy that honestly should have been something. He was a lot like Crimson was for TNA. A big, tall, muscular dude. Really, really looked the same. Who just, they almost let beat almost everybody. But um, just one thing led to another and he never really got his break. And I don't even know what he did in wrestling after WCW, if anything. Uh, Scott Steiner wrestled against Rick Steiner and Tank, Tank Abbott in an Asylum match. Asylum matches are pretty cool. It's almost like um, a dome that surrounded the ring. If you could think of like a uh, like the Elimination Chamber sort of has that you know dome effect over it. Only that it's smaller and it fits inside of the ring. Um... Hogan beat Billy Kidman. Uh, Horace Hogan was a special guest referee. The whole deal was that basically Kidman never trusted Horace and always thought something was going down. This was what started to lead to Kidman, um, you know, wanting to leave the new blood. Um, Hogan versus Kidman was a whole deal that they thought Kidman was going to be like the next big star because he was a, a you know, a big time baby face and everybody, you know, all the girls really liked him and swooned all over him. He got a win over Hogan, I believe, on a Monday Nitro and uh, basically Hogan never let the world forget about it because, uh, I don't know, in my mind, honestly, this was a pay-per-view style match that Hogan probably should have let Kidman go over if Kidman was going to be the guy, but Kidman's talked to, uh, I mean, sorry, Hogan has talked a lot about this uh these matches and just basically saying that like why would you let a guy you know most of the time refers to Kidman as a flea uh beat this guy but you know somehow with uh, Hulk Hogan uh you know his deals uh if he won this match uh he got to be the number one contender at the next pay-per-view if he lost the match he would be forced to retire you see this a lot uh with WCW most of the time with Ric Flair um, but it's funny because the next Flair match that was on the card, that was the, the same sort of deal. If Flair lost, he had to retire, but I don't know. Hogan versus Kidman is probably something you need to see to, to believe that it happened and that WCW tried to actually make it seem like a big deal, but the match really wasn't all that great. Uh, in the next match, Ric Flair, uh, wrestled David Flair in a match that nobody ever had to see. Um, WCW really tried to make David Flair a big star. I've never heard from, from Ric Flair if he wanted David to get into wrestling or if David wanted to or if maybe just WCW threw so much money at the guy that he had to do it. Um, but basically, uh, Rick beat David as he should have with the figure four leg lock and, um, 
<laughs> the match sucked. Uh, and the next match was, was the match that everybody was talking about. It seems like with WCW, they always hyped up this, the semi-main more than they did the main event. And they made it seem like it was supposed to be a, you know, a really, really big deal. And that was Van Piro wrestling Sting in a Human Torch match. These guys really didn't like each other. I don't even know what was the reason that really started their feud in WCW. Uh, but basically, they started their... Well, no. <laughs> okay. Sting... Uh, Vampiro came out and he went to the ring with a gas can. Sting came out on top of the Nitrotron. That's where he made his... In he, he came in and he told Vampiro, if you want to fight me, you have to fight me up here. So he called Vampiro out. So as Vampiro got out of the ring to come up and fight him, Sting repelled down the side of the Nitrotron and they repeated the fight on the set and build their way back down to wrestling in the ring. Now, why did Sting challenge him to a fight up there if Sting was just going to come down from there? It almost seems like Sting was the guy to fight Vampiro up there, not Vampiro was the guy that was scared to fight Sting. But basically, as you can believe, the fight ends up on top of the WCW Nitrotron up there, and uh, they fought around. Finally, uh, Sting had been doused in, in gasoline somehow throughout this match. There's a point where... Both of the guys basically fall down, and for some reason, there's like a thunder and lightning effect going on in this match, where the lights go on, the lights go off. They sort of flash, like there's some thunder going off inside of the arena, like some demons are loose in there. I have really no clue what is going on in there. It really made me think of like the Dudley Boys versus Team... No, Dudley Boys versus LAX in the... Um, electrocution style uh, cage where like they, they they would throw each other into the cage and then they would have the, the 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 sound effects go off inside of the impact zone i don't know just really bootleg sort of you know trash stuff um finally you can tell that there's a point where there's sting is fighting vampiro and he punches him and punches him sting sells it like he's gonna hit the ropes so he goes backwards and then somebody steps up into the forefront and actually gets lit on fire and he goes to the end of the Nitro set, looks down, and my only guess is that he's like, the crash pad isn't where he's supposed to. So he runs back like he's hitting the ropes and runs to another part of the set and finally splash dives off of it. A pretty cool and amazing thing if it would have been Sting, but it was pretty dead obvious that it wasn't Sting. So it, it sort of took away from it in the long run. And the main event of this is probably the one of the things that people will think about as the dying days of WCW more than anything else. In this match, it was Jeff Jarrett against Kevin Nash. And throughout the whole pay-per-view, uh, Eric Bischoff was in the back sort of begging and pleading, you know, keeping uh, the cops and security around him, saying that Goldberg was looking for him and Goldberg was going to get him. Keep him away from the show if anywhere possible, uh, there was, uh, you know, reports and they actually showed it on, you know, video that the Goldberg monster truck was driving around the outside of the show. Um, I don't know. They, they showed the monster truck, just WCW booking a monster truck to show up to a pay-per-view shows up how much money they had to throw around and how much money they had to waste during this match. Uh, you know, the, the, the filthy animals all gave themselves sort of special, you know, jobs to do out there. Conan was the bell ringer. Rey Mysterio was the timekeeper. Disco held the bell. Juventud Guerrero was the guest ring announcer as like the rock parody. And uh, they wrestled around and they wrestled around and finally Goldberg showed up in the monster truck, made his way down to the ring. And uh, he's in the corner about to do the spear on Jarrett. Jarrett gets up from the selling and he's still sitting there all football style like he's ready to pounce. Finally he pounces on Kevin Nash and the surprise that should have happened 30 seconds earlier, and Jarrett got the win to become the champion. Uh, Goldberg joins the New Blood in one of the one of the things nobody wanted to see and nobody wanted to care about. I think this is definitely one of the things that killed WCW in the long run, as well as on the next pay-per-view, the Great American Bash 2000, where they did the whole Hogan and Russo shoot interview, shoot angle, where uh, they basically fired Hogan and... Uh, uh, made their new WCW champion, which was supposed to push them in another new direction that never worked out. But um, honestly, see the Goldberg heel turn, and um, maybe that was honestly it. <laughs> see Hogan versus Kidman. This was an all... No, I can't even say that. This sucked. This was bad. <laughs> I mean, like, this is what the network's for. I'm sure this is the show that I'm going to watch once and never watch again, but it's it's there. I mean, you got to watch something with it. Get your money's worth. Peace out.